really want to talk about cybersecurity at <clears throat> from the perspective of the sorts of vulnerabilities that we do face today, so not theoretical threats that could happen tomorrow, but are in the world and were realized by professionals now. But before I get to actually talking about any particular vulnerability, I want to take a brief step back. And I want to talk about what is a vulnerability and critically, what is the difference between security engineering and resilience engineering? Because they're very different practices, very different mindsets. And that's really to underscore that if we rely purely on resilience engineers, we will always have security vulnerabilities while also underscoring the problems or the difficulties of putting all of our trust in security engineers themselves. I'll then talk about some of these vulnerabilities, and I'm just going to conclude by pointing to some policy recommendations that I think would be very helpful for overall enhancing the identification of vulnerabilities and the reduction of vulnerabilities in the systems that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So just to begin, what is a vulnerability in a computer system? A vulnerability can best be defined as an exposure of a given system to an adversary that wants to attack that system. And so basically what that means is when we see that there's a problem, we see there's a vulnerability, some sort of error in the system, we can then say, well, how, how risky is it? What's the risk attached to that vulnerability? And there what we're doing is we're saying, okay, well, how likely is it that someone in the world is going to be motivated to actually exploit that vulnerability? And then how serious is it? Is it something like it's going to prevent you from using your ATM card once at a, bank, at a banking machine? Well, okay, that's, that's a problem. Or is it going to turn off the ATM infrastructure in a region? Or is it going to uh, cause uh, long-term instability in the stock market? Obviously, we have different gradients of seriousness, and as such, we attach different levels of risk to the failures. But systems themselves fail in two very different ways. Risks are calculated based on different kinds of vulnerabilities. So the two ways that systems themselves fail are active failures and passive failures. So a passive failure involves a system failing in the face of an attack. It doesn't it is supposed to do something and it doesn't. So an example of this would be uh, with everyone in the room that has a cellular uh, phone, when you make a phone call, you're supposed to set up, your phone sets this up, it happens invisibly to you, it sets up an encrypted communications link between you and the nearest cellular tower. So a passive system, a passive failure would be, you can still make your phone call, but the encryption is not applied. And this is a real world attack that we have seen and continue to see actually used by both law enforcement for legitimate law invest, uh, investigation purposes, but also by other actors. Um, and I'll get into that uh, briefly in a bit. There are also active failures. And this is where the system takes an action that it absolutely should not. And so turning back to this notion of encryption once more, this could be something whereby your phone is supposed to encrypt your communications in a certain way using a certain uh, security protocol. And rather than using the one it's supposed to be using, an alternate one is adopted. Now why would that happen? Because the threat actor may be able to compromise that latter mode of encryption, the mode that they want to force you to use, such that they can read or modify or otherwise understand your data in real time. And the people who are, or the actors that are interested in taking advantage of system failures are very diverse. It runs from, it runs the gamut. There are, of course, criminals. There's also state-affiliated actors. These are not individuals formally in the employ of a state, but receive some sort of benefit. And so this could be a criminal gang, as an example, that works on behalf of government, and in response, the government agrees to not prosecute them. It could be state actors, such as a foreign signals intelligence agency or a security service, and it can also be a domestic security force or domestic law enforcement. And the purposes of those attackers from an engineering perspective are very different. For law, for, from a law enforcement perspective, they are perhaps attacking a system, but the goal is to identify uh, criminal elements and then collect evidence to bring them to justice. 
Private companies are also involved in this for espionage purposes more often than not, as well as hacktivists or individuals who uh, are not state actors. They may be politically motivated, but don't fit cleanly and nicely into any of the common uh, threat actor categories. So the key question that we have to ask when we're looking at attackers is who is motivated to attack a given system? Why? What do they want? Um, how often are they likely to perform an attack? How likely are they to succeed? And do different actors engage in different tactics when they're attacking the same system? But why exactly do systems fail? In part, this is because of the way that resiliency engineering operates versus security engineering. So security engineering is about ensuring that certain actions do not happen. In contrast, normal or resiliency engineering is principally concerned with ensuring that activities do happen regardless of the surrounding characteristics. So let me give you two examples of that. First, let's picture a bridge. Um, I imagine many of you uh, are familiar with Toronto, so I'll use the gardener as it's a good example. Um, anyone who has passed under the gardener knows that the, uh, there are some areas that perhaps are not in the best of repair. But nevertheless, the gardener remains stable. People can drive atop it. Even though pieces of it sometimes fall down, it is safe to drive atop. That's resiliency engineering at work. Despite the fact that there has been some damage to the bridge itself, the highway itself, it remains usable for its primary purpose of moving traffic. However, obviously pieces of, of that infrastructure are damaged. So what a security engineer is, is interested in is not how do we keep the bridge up despite certain levels of damage. Is there a way in which I can intentionally provoke the bridge to break apart in certain ways? Even if there's only a 1 in 1,000 or 1 in 10,000 or 1 in 100,000 chance that you can actively, consistently cause the bridge to fail in a certain way, a security engineer wants to find that. They want to exploit it. And if they're there to protect the system, figure out how to avoid that action from taking place. But if they're a security engineer interested in attacking the system, in exploiting that vulnerability, they want to know how they can reliably and consistently exploit that vulnerability. So to give you another example in a computer domain, we can turn to something like um, encryption, similar to what you use in your web browsers when you go to your bank. So many of you uh, have probably heard, you know, look for the little green lock and if you see it, then you have an encrypted communication so you can put in your passwords or something like that. So unfortunately, what is often the case is that the developers who build those websites are resilience-minded folks. And so they want to make sure that your communication always proceeds regardless of whether or not the correct person is saying it's an encrypted communication. And by that I mean uh, there is a setting. So if it is disabled, if it just accepts any person saying, yes, it's encrypted. When you're going to the CIBC, as an example, if there's someone in the middle of that traffic, they could present their own certificate saying, oh, no, no, I, I'm CIBC. It's okay. You can, you can send it through. And then they may pass the data traffic over to CIBC so your transaction flows normally. The downside being there's someone in the middle of your communications traffic who is then able to access and see all of the activities that you're engaged in in that banking transaction. So that's resilience, resiliency engineering. They want to ensure that you're able to use the web in a way that doesn't disrupt the consumer experience. A security engineer, in contrast, uh, would look at that and say, no, 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 this is not resilience we want. This is bad resilience. And indeed, part of that infrastructure is designed to facilitate when you get that bad person in the middle saying, no, no, I'm CIBC. It says, no, you're not. And it stops the connection. But we can see that there's a very different mindset involved in ensuring that your transactions, your life, your day goes on the way it should, even when stumbling blocks arise, versus those that are like, no, when we see certain stumbling blocks, we just need to stop. So with that in mind, what are the kinds of system vulnerabilities that exist today? So I'm just going to um, give highlights, so I'm not going to go too deep into any of this, just so that there's an idea of the, the range and diversity of threats. I'm also going to focus principally 
on the kinds of vulnerabilities that are linked to communication systems, in part because of my background, but in part because uh, digital communications networks are essential to every aspect of everything that we do in our daily lives today. So first turning to the communications sector. We can identify in all of these sectors uh, individual uh, vulnerabilities that affect individuals, that affect regions, and that are global. So what would be an individual vulnerability in the communications infrastructure? Well, just as an example, many people, most people that have smartphones in, in the world, writ large, are using the Android operating system. Now, the Android operating system, in order to receive an update, that update typically has to be approved by the telecommunications carrier. And the reason why it has to be approved, ostensibly, is because the carrier has to look at that update. They have to ensure that when they implement it on their mobile devices, that their customers have, that those devices still work on the network. That's resiliency engineering at work. But the problem with that is it slows, delays, or prevents security updates that security engineers are pushing out from getting to end users in time. Now, what is the result of that significant delay, that contrast between the security engineers wanting to update your products as quickly as possible and resilience engineers wanting to slow it down to make sure it works? Well, it means that companies such as Hacking Team and FinFish or companies that the Citizen Lab uh, monitors and chases around the world quite often, they're able to develop weaponized systems, systems that they sell to governments um, often of dubious um, ethical and human rights, with dubious ethical and human rights records. And those systems can be used to target individual citizens. And those citizens can be, in some cases, opposition at members of parliament, journalist, journalists, uh, NGO staff, and so forth. And so, at an individual level, the systemic vulnerabilities in the handsets we use can endanger individuals. But it gets worse because even in the old dumb phones, it was possible to send to certain phones a single SMS message. It would go to that phone, it would then propagate through every person in the contact list, and then permanently disable the mobile device. And so this is another case where you could target an individual and have system, uh, systemic effects across many users across a region. So what would be some examples of global system vulnerabilities in the communications environment? Well, to begin, we can really point to encryption. So we rely on our signals intelligence agencies, the National Security Agency, communications security establishment, and other groups like that to provide high-level advice to governments for this is the kind of cryptography that we need to adopt to keep our communications safe. Unfortunately, as a result of some of the Snowden documents, we've found that, in fact, these agencies have propagated, knowingly, knowingly propagated deficient encryption. Th those encryption protocols were then put on devices all around the world. It was used in the smart tokens that many employees would use to authenticate to their corporate networks. It was embedded in Windows operating systems and so forth. So that enabled other actors to decrypt communications in real time. Also, we know that uh, state level actors are currently able to decrypt roughly two thirds of all virtual private network communications, as well as about a quarter of all SSH communications. Now, VPNs are typically used to enter into computer systems when you're working remotely. It's meant to keep your data safe and secure from intermediaries from seeing what's going on. Unfortunately, as we've recently discovered, it, doesn't, it isn't as effective as we had hoped. And in particular, the kinds of VPNs that are targeted in this are those that are principally used by businesses, both to communicate with employees in home office and also employees to reach the critical infrastructure. And SSH is also used quite often for remote command processes. In addition to that, and I'll move on to other sectors, there's something called the SS7 network. Now, all of us are a member of this and we really don't know it. It was, it was the initial specs of it were designed and implemented in the 1980s. And it's the back end of the cellular network. It's really what ensures that when you make a phone call 
it gets to where it's going on the other part of the world. So even though you have an encrypted communication between yourself and the cell tower, past that point, it's vulnerable to exploitation. In private vendors, national security agencies, and uh, some uh, domestic authorities are able to use this in order to forward your messages. So you may be contacting someone, calling them. It can be diverted, recorded, and then passed to its destination. It can be used to track individuals as they move around the world, and so forth. So it offers an unparalleled mode of global surveillance. And again, not a theoretical threat, something that is used today. So what are some of the other examples? Well, we can turn now to say uh, finance. Is many people who have looked at the financial uh, system, in particular stock markets, are probably well aware, trading happens on a millisecond basis. Being uh, two milliseconds late to a trade can be incredibly damaging. And indeed, when you disrupt the communications links between the major uh, uh, trading organizations, as well as between the major exchanges, you can have disruptive global impacts on the economy. So what can happen here? Well, here we have all sorts of vulnerable infrastructure. To begin with, we have the simple physical lines that are responsible for carrying communications from point A to point B. And indeed, banks such as Goldman Sachs and others invest hundreds of millions of dollars to shave milliseconds off of their time between themselves and the exchanges. And so disrupting those links, not so that Goldman Sachs can never contact um, a stock exchange, but simply delay them by milliseconds can have uh, catastrophic, catastrophic consequences because their algorithms for high frequency trading then are disrupted. And so they will begin sending trade requests that are out of sync with the way the market functions. And we've seen what happens when there are problems with high frequency algorithms because the stock market collapses briefly. It's happened several times in the past couple of years halts are put on trades, and then they try and walk back a couple hours and then start things going forward again. But if you're damaging the physical infrastructure, as an example, that redo gets much more challenging because you have to figure out where was the communications link severed or damaged, repair it, and then trading can properly begin uh, anew. What happens when we look at health? Well, in health, Probably one of the most prominent areas we can see problems right now are found immediately when we turn to the United States. And I don't pick on the United States because of their healthcare system, but rather because of activities that state level actors or alleged state level actors have engaged in towards that system. So over the past year and a half, two years, there's been a systematic effort to enter into insurance companies in the United States and extract patient information. That has then been correlated with other information that's been exfiltrated from government agencies, as well as from transport agencies. The broad effect of that is to not only the potential to modify uh, the actual records held by insurance companies, which could be detrimental to individuals' health, obviously, when they try to access or use their insurance, but the other effect has been to develop enormous espionage potential, the ability, because of a system break, because of core system vulnerabilities in the way that healthcare is provided and secured, to then deliberately target individuals for subsequent espionage or other illicit activities. Moreover, in the healthcare system, as we move to uh, e-health records, the potential to either enter into systems and even if data itself is not changed, even if data itself is not modified, the simple occupation, a temporary intrusion into health systems can reduce the trust in the system, lead to concerns, questions, and that can have an ongoing fiscal impact both through audits and in efforts to regain the trust of the population that don't worry, your data is safe, don't worry, you will be getting the proper medications and so forth. And then what happens if we look at transportation? Transportation is undergoing a revolution that we're only beginning to see. We'll really see what it looks like in the next 20 years. But we're starting to see the impacts of poor security engineering already. Cars now are increasingly connected to mobile networks. This means that it is possible to get all sorts of great things in your cars. 
You get Google Maps built in. You get all sorts of helpful, useful things for the consumer. But unfortunately, these same systems are often poorly secured, with one of the most prominent examples of this being that Charlie Miller and colleagues, Charlie is a former NSA an uh, not analyst, he developed malware and broke systems. He's now in the private industry. Charlie was able to, in a test that was done with Wired, turn off a reporter's vehicle while on a highway. At the same time, he was able to see all other Jeeps of a similar make and model that were driving through the United States of America. There was no way to provide an update over the air. Jeep has had to put in, a, I think it's a 1.4 million vehicle recall so that they can manually perform those updates. Many vehicles will never go into the dealership, they will never be patched. We are getting to a point where not only do we have computers in our system, in our cars, but we have a way to access them remotely. This is an incredibly serious issue, but we're fortunately at the earliest stages, so hopefully we can avoid a catastrophic problem in the near future. So are we doomed? <laughs> I don't actually think so. So to begin with, I think that, as other speakers have mentioned, focusing on social resiliency is important. What do you do when you're unable to make a cellular phone call? What do you do if you can't drive a car for a few days or longer? These are social issues that we can work through. Um, in a catastrophic event where you know we're, we're, we're absent power for a year plus, I think we're in a, there I have more doom. Um, but for most scenarios that we've seen where individuals have attacked infrastructure, it is robust because resiliency engineering is the core way engineers think. And we are very good at bringing systems back up, even if in the process of bringing them up, they aren't at their full efficiency. Moreover, not all attacks are equal in likelihood or consequence. So a temporary disruption of any system is one thing. A permanent disruption is another. And fortunately, many of, the, many of the attacks or many of the vulnerabilities that I've discussed, one of their primary values actually for state-level actors, criminal actors, and so forth, is for intelligence. Because as soon as you exploit one of these things once, it's very obvious what you've done, you elicit an immediate response from the public, from politicians, because they all freak out. And then you see those vulnerabilities start to close because there's political will, there's money, and there's talent. Whereas if you don't have that, that moment of, oh no, you can continue just monitoring what's going on, extracting continual intelligence value. And finally, most of these things that I've discussed are non-trivial to pull off at the moment, which also means that there is a fairly uh, small group of actors. It's, it's not one or two people, it's you know several hundreds of thousands. But in the, the greater context of the world, it's not a huge population that can pull any of these off. The problem, however, is that as soon as an academic, as an example, figures out a theoretical way of attacking a system, it immediately starts the race to see who can turn this into a demonstrable exploit and then a productized exploit against these systems. So just in the, the last minute, I just want to identify some policy things that would be very helpful for improving resiliency in decreasing vulnerabilities. Right now, various jurisdictions around the world are having a really hard time trying to figure out what to do with both academics and non-academic, non-corporate researchers who some people paint, other people break systems. It's what they do as their hobby, it's what just they love. And it's important that we have methods and methodology so those people can then report to companies and say, hey, I found this huge problem in your vehicle. I found this problem in the way you're running your market. I found this problem in the way that you run encryption. I found this problem, insert area. Provide it to the engineering staff, preferably, and have that taken up into a company without those same engineers, without those same people breaking systems for fun, being threatened with lawsuits. What often happens outside of the IT community is you will go and you'll say, aha, I found, this, I found this massive problem in the way that you run financial engagements. And the engineers more often than not are like, this is a problem, we're going to fix that. And then it goes to legal, and then it goes to, if you say a word about this to anyone, we're going to sue you. As soon as you have that reaction, 
those researchers, those white hack, white hat hackers, are incredibly disincentivized to ever come forward again. And that doesn't mean they stop. An artist, just because they get bad reviews, doesn't stop painting. But rather, they don't show the public. They don't show what's going on. And so I know many people who, as a result of um, overly litigious companies, simply refrain from providing notification. They don't exploit. They're not trying to break into systems themselves. But it means that we're all less secure because we have, in some areas, very litigious uh, sectors of the economy. And so I think one of the key things is finding a way such that we can facilitate the people who are actually good citizens trying to help out and empowering and enabling them to go through that process and keep us all safe because if they've found it and their spare time more often than not, you can be very certain that other parties who are not doing it in their spare time but are paid to it do derive financial benefit from it either legally or illegally will similar, are similarly likely to come across the same sorts of vulnerabilities. So if, my, if, I, if there's any takeaway, it's that there are norms that the, the software community has developed over the past 25 years to try and patch and keep us safe as we move towards a world and an economy that is increasingly attached to digital systems, it is equally important that we take up the best norms of the software industry today and apply it to emerging Internet of Things industries now. Because otherwise, we're going to have 20 years and we really will just have to hope that there isn't a catastrophe. And unfortunately, the chances of that would not be good. Thank you.